Welcome to the She Said Privacy, He Said Security podcast. Like any good marriage, we will debate, evaluate, and sometimes quarrel about how privacy and security impact business in the 21st century. Hi, Jody Daniels here. I'm the founder and CEO of Red Clover Advisors, a certified women's privacy consultancy. I'm a privacy consultant and a certified informational privacy professional, and I provide practical privacy advice to overwhelmed companies. Justin Daniels here. I am passionate about helping companies solve complex cyber and privacy challenges during the life cycle of their business. I do that through identifying the problem and coming up with practicable, implementable solutions. I am the cyber quarterback helping companies design and implement cyber plans and also quarterbacking when they deal with the data breach. And this episode is brought to you by Red Clover Advisors. We help companies to comply with data privacy laws and establish customer trust so that they can grow and nurture integrity. We work with companies in a variety of fields, including technology, SaaS, e-commerce, media agencies, and professional and financial services. In short, we use data privacy to transform the way companies do business. Together, we're creating a future where there's greater trust between companies and consumers. To learn more, visit redcloveradvisors.com. I see you're very businessy today. And businessy? What does that mean? You've got on your business shirt, your business. Oh, you mean I'm not in like a t-shirt? Yeah, like what I do. I'm not in the casual. Yeah, that's true. All right. Are you gonna introduce introduce? I can't even speak. (laughs) I'm super casual. You're going to introduce our guest today. Sure. So Zach Schuler is the CEO and founder of Ninjio, a cybersecurity awareness training company that empowers individuals and organizations to become defenders against cyber threats. He is a member of the Forbes Technology Council, and his thoughts on the future of cybersecurity have appeared in Dark Reading, Innovation and Tech Today, Home Business Journal, Inc. Magazine, Cyber Defense Magazine, CISO Magazine, and more. Well, Zach, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, you do look very businessy compared to me as well, because I've got the same uh, T-shirt on that Justin does, just a different color. You know, I just thought I'd mix it up a bit. <laughs> you know, as I thought about your intro, Zach, it's like if you publish things in the dark reading, it's you're helping bring people into the light when it comes to cybersecurity training. I hope so. That's that's the plan. I okay. Hope so. Well, we always like to get started by understanding where you began your career in cybersecurity and how you found your way to starting Ninjio. I'm not going to give you the whole story because uh, that would be about two and a half hours and we've only got about 20 minutes. So uh, I'll give you a very truncated version. Um, Back in uh, 1995, I started an IT consulting business when I was 21 years old. And uh, that business grew from me being what was called back then a trunk slammer, where I would go around from company to company and work on their IT issues. Um, I got pretty busy doing that. So I hired people. And over the course of 18 years, I built uh, what's called a managed services provider uh, that that, uh, serves small and medium-sized businesses for their IT support. And it built that company up to about 100 employees and roughly 20 million of of annual revenue. one of the things that I saw pretty consistently, especially toward the latter years of the business, uh, were people uh, being breached. And at that point, I didn't have much of a cyber situation, but uh, I was forced to get one. And, uh, you know, we would have to respond to breaches and help get people, you know, kind of back up and running again. And then we officially started a, a cybersecurity practice about uh, three years before I sold that that business. and. Um, so sold that business in 2013, and then 2015, July 15th, uh, specifically, I had the idea for Ninjio because when looking at all the cyber awareness training that was out there, there were these death by PowerPoint, 45 minute long, um, you know, put you to sleep type lecture based learnings, and I just had this epiphany that there's got to be something better. That there's no way that this format of training is working. And that there just has to be something better than that. And so kind of took out a blank canvas and uh, thought, you know, if I were Joe, your average everyday end user wanting to learn about 
cyber, something that I don't really need to know how to do to get my job done, um, how would I, you know, how would I want to be educated? And came up with just some core concepts, right? Three to four minute long animated stories. So our stuff is story based instead of lecture based. And, um, you know, using a real Hollywood writer to create the stories, to make them engaging. Um, and that really, you know, kind of set the foundation for the start of Ninjio. I love that you're story-based and thank you for sharing the background. I think it's always really, really interesting to understand how uh, kind of your history and your experiences shape the next iteration. So thank you again for sharing. Yeah. So what can we learn from neuroscience, which is a big part of what Ninjio does to help people not beat the wink link or cybersecurity? Yeah, I think um, when we talk about neuroscience, we, we really talk about how it, um, how it plays together with our solution and how our solution was kind of developed with, with you know, some uh, behavioral, um, you know, uh, behavioral things in mind as, as things were getting developed. And so um, when I think about neuroscience and, and, and cybersecurity, I, I think about the way that people learn, right? And um, there have been study upon study upon study, and this whole new term of kind of micro learning started coming out uh, probably seven, eight years ago. And, and, and I think we were the first to jump on the bandwagon with respect to doing our training in micro learning, which is three to four minutes, right? Four minute is kind of that magic number of where you can still keep people's attention. And then a lot of the other principles of neuroscience that we applied, number one, um, storytelling because people can get emotionally engaged into a story. They cannot get emotionally engaged to a lecture. Uh, another piece that we targeted uh, about um, you know, neuroscience being uh, really the, the study of the, the nervous system is emotionally engaging the end user in the first scene of every episode, right? It's kind of like a good book. You know, open up a good book or a good movie and you want that first part to just be impactful and really suck you in. And we do everything in our power to do that in every episode that we uh, create. Um, another concept uh, that we have kind of, you know, really latched onto is, is how do you get people to retain information? Again, another kind of neuroscientific principle. And so rather than just showing somebody a piece of learning one time, you need to show them that piece of learning. You need to knowledge check them on that. And then you need to reinforce that learning, you know, over and over again for a period of time so that it really anchors the learning into the brain. So I would say that's kind of how neuroscience plays into our solution. So you had just shared uh, about how you need to have people be able to retain that information. Yeah. Is it that you create different stories for the same concept or is the suggestion to have people hear literally the same one, but you need to hear it multiple times? Because the big theme, so many companies do training one time, they check the box. We're like, well, that was great. So you could do the four minute increments. Woohoo, I check the box, my once a year, I'm good. And I think what we're talking about instead is, no, actually you want to, to do this probably every couple months or every month, introduce some type of concept, not just one day a year because there's 364 other days of the year. Yeah, that's right. So um, yes, we do cover the same type of topic, take it like ransomware, right? Ransomware is what we call one of our core four episodes. And so every season uh, we will cover ransomware. And so we're in season uh, six right now. So you can get, you can bet that we've done six episodes on, on ransomware. However, when I talk about retention, um, I'm gonna take it a step further in that, yes, we release an episode every 30 days, like clockwork. We've never, knock on wood, missed a deadline. But our methodology is such that on the first, if you're following our methodology, on the first Tuesday of the month, your employees, your learners will watch one of our episodes. As I said, they're you know three to four minutes long. The second week of the month, we release a, an infographic that is reinforcing the teachable moments of the episode that they saw the week prior. And that can get consumed in about 30 seconds. And it's really critical that the consumption rate of content be very small, especially after they've seen four minutes already. And so we have the 30 second infographic that goes out the next week. The week after that, we have what we call an anchoring cartoon can be consumed in about 10 seconds. 
And it's just a quick little cartoon, again, reinforcing that teachable moment. And then we provide our clients with a wealth of other assets, um, things like lock screen. So when you lock your computer, you see the characters that were in our episode for that particular month and the teachable takeaways that are associated with that. We've got posters, we've got just all sorts of different collateral um, that really help reinforce that message of whatever that message might be throughout that particular month. So we're very thematic throughout a month and we really wanna pound those teachable takeaways into our, our learners' heads. Sounds like if they had the Ted Lasso episodes with cybersecurity, they'd have you in a second. <laughs> they would. They would. I actually, they talk on that. I don't know if you watch that show, but they include privacy and security a fair amount. It's really oh, interesting. interesting. They really do. But I guess, you know, to build on this uh, topic is it sounds like these characters and the episodes and you're kind of telling a story. Is that really what stands out about Ninjio training? Because I've had training at my job and it literally can put me to sleep and it's by one of the largest players in the space. So talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Y yes, it, it is. It is the competitive differentiator. And I'll, I'll go a little deeper into that. Um, but I want to explain because Justin brought this up. There, there are companies in the industry, and, and this industry is growing with companies almost by the day. And there are companies in the industry that take what we call a fishing first approach. And so simulated fishing, uh, for the audience that might not know, is where the company will actually send out a fake phishing email to see how many of its employees actually take the bait and, and click on the email. When you click on the email, it doesn't do the business any harm. It just says, oh. You took the bait, you clicked on the email, and then there's a bunch of different actions that can happen after that, depending upon kind of the company's approach. Um, and so uh, a lot of our competitors, or let's just say that the 800-pound gorillas in the industry, they have a fishing first mentality where they will, and, and we call that testing, where they're going to fish the employees first and train them second. We say, well, when you go to college, when you walk in the door on the first day, you don't take a test of your you know, biology course, right? You learn for a couple of weeks and then you take the test after that. And so we have very much a content first and education first approach where we want to train people on the threats that they're going to face. And then we will run our simulated phishing um, campaigns after the training has, has been done. And so being a content first company, we get hyper focused on the content, the quality of the content. Our writer is a former writer for CSI New York and Hawaii Five-0. Uh, every episode since um, season, the end of season five, uh, features a celebrity actor. And so we've had uh, John Lovitz on a whole number of our episodes, uh, Robert Dobby, uh, Stacey Keach, you know, lots of uh, famous celebrity voice actors uh, are within each one of our episodes. And, um, you know, to this day, from a content perspective, uh, we are still kind of known as the kings of content in the industry. And, and, and that's really our differentiator and what we like to lead with. So what do you think are some of the big challenges that companies face in getting people to absorb, retain, and even take or sign up for training? Um, there are a multitude of challenges. Number one is, is Justin uh, so adequately pointed out, he's taken training before that puts people to sleep. Nobody wants to take training that's going to put you to sleep. And if that's the case, you're kind of going to do everything that you can in order to avoid that training. So from a company perspective, number one, you, you really need to you know, make training mandatory. Um, the, the biggest reason why people don't take it is because it's not engaging. They feel like it's a waste of time. They feel like they're not learning anything from it. And so everything that we have done has been to combat that argument, right? And we don't want it to be like this massive chore for you to have to do even once a year, sit down for 45 minutes and go through this. Um, we certainly don't want people taking training where the training is running and it's on one side of the screen, you know, we've got these big screens now. So you can read the training on one side 
put your outlook up on the other side, you know, work, 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 training's going on. Oh, all of a sudden they're asking me a question. Let me take a good guess. Click. Right. So we're trying to avoid all that and keep people engaged. And what I can tell you unequivocally, beyond a shadow of a doubt, engagement is the number one thing that a company needs to focus on is getting their employees engaged in the training. And our solution, we do everything on our power to make that as easy as possible for our clients. Makes sense. Curious on on that topic. Yeah. Do you find in the situations where people are really engaged, how does the messaging from the C-suite come into play when you're trying to deploy your training? So important. Such a great question. The the C-suite in most organizations, you've got, you know, most organizations of say 500 people or, or greater. You've got a chief information security officer, CISO, CSO, um, whatever the acronym is you, you want to call that person. Most of the time when training is released, it's coming either from the CISO or from the office of the CISO. Now, where we have been uber successful is when the CISO has gone to the CEO and said, we're signing up for this training, or, or maybe the CEO blesses the training if they're small enough, whatever. When you can have messaging coming from the office of the CEO that says, um, and, and we arm our clients with all this information, um, you know, dear employees, we're going to be adopting a new style of training. It comes from a company called Ninjio. Here are the you know, points to look after, and here's what it's all about, et cetera, et cetera. If that introduction comes from the C-suite, and not only that, but you've had the entire C-suite, I'm sorry, comes from the CEO. And you've had the entire C-suite prior to that messaging bought into the solution so that they and their departments can also push out messaging that really stresses you know, the importance of security awareness training. That's when you're going to end up with the best result. People are sick and tired of just getting emails from the cybersecurity department about training or from the CISO you know, about training or, or whatever it is. It has to be a top-down um, mandatory exercise that ultimately, if the CEO can be the one that's pushing it from the top down, the results are going to be dramatically different. I'm glad you made that point because I deal with a lot of companies at that C-suite level. And if they don't buy into any of this, it's dead on arrival. So I really appreciate you making the point about why the C-suite Buy in and be even great if they had a video watching the CEO do the training him or herself. That would be even be better. But that, that's a good idea. We might work that into our onboarding process. Maybe give the CEO the voice of like Stacy Keach or somebody. <laughs> do that too. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, people do love watching their leaders do things that they don't expect them to do. So if they're able to be in a character, it puts them in a different place, almost more equal. So they have the respect of the position, but then it's, oh, wow, you're just a person like me. You can be silly or interesting or like you, you're who, what? <clears throat> and then they'll, yeah. they'll connect. Yeah. Build the CEO as one of the characters in the story. That yeah. would be awesome. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, you, you guys are giving me some ideas as we're sitting here. Glad, sure. glad to help. <laughs> one of the things that I found so fascinating about how you've approached training is not only about making sure employees are aware of the security risks and taking training, but also by extending it to the families yeah. of an employee. And, you know, when Justin and I do a fair amount of speaking, we often will use stories about for any parents in the audience, we have a big passion about keeping kids safe online. And we'll use stories like that to try and help, or even just a personal story. Because then when the person realizes it in their personal life, they're a little bit more encouraged and, and willing to apply it at work. Can right. you share a little bit more about the philosophy and kind of what you do around that education to the whole family and not just to the employee? Yeah, 100%. So Back in 2017, I was on a call with uh, our Gartner analyst at the time, um, a gal by the name of uh, Joanna uh, Huseman, Heisman. Um, and she, in no uncertain terms, said, Zach, 
you are the only provider that produces content that can equally apply to people at home as it can at work, right? We get ransomware at home, we get ransomware at work, we get fished at home, we get fished at work, et cetera. So not really having a motivation to monetize the consumer, that wasn't you know, really part of our, our plan. And, and um, y- we decided to create this program called Friends and Family Use Rights. And so essentially what happens is the first Thursday of the month, the family members that the employee signs up will get the same Ninjio episode that the employee got a couple of days prior to that. And now this is where neuroscience really starts to come into play, or um, it might even not be called neuroscience at this point, but we, we call this uh, going up beyond behavioral change because what the end goal is, is to get the entire family educated on the same topic. And then to get them sitting around the dinner table and having a conversation about that. And once the employee at the company knows that they're sharing the education that they learned with their family and protecting their family, they have this epiphany of like, oh, it's not just the company forcing training down my throat. They now view it as a four minute break out of their workday, or more importantly, a benefit, an employee benefit that they're given that crosses over to the family, they naturally now become the subject matter expert of cyber within the family. And this creates this really strong personal connection between the employee and cybersecurity awareness, believe it or not. The end result of that is they go back to the organization and they are that much more aware, their radar is that much more up because now they've taken this, they've they've gotten this personal connection to awareness training. And so not only have we changed employee behavior, we've done what we call, we've changed their digital security identity. And if you'll allow me one more minute to kind of explain that, you know, when, when you, and I'll ask a question here, um, if you take your car and you drive into a busy parking lot, at Costco, I'm assuming you have Costco's where you are, right? And, and you get out of the car, what's the first thing that you do? I lock it. I'm going to take all my things with me. There you go. You lock it. And do you have to remember to like pull out your key and hit the button to lock the car? I'm assuming you don't have a Tesla, which we just walk out and it locks by itself. But, (laughs) um, you know, you you really don't have to remember to lock the car, right? You just, it's It's like, it's instinctual. Like you reach out into your pocket, boom, hit the thing instinctually. When you leave for work in the morning from home, if you're, you know, not working from home like we all are, but let's just pretend that you leave your home for vacation, you lock the front door. It's like, you don't really have to think about it. It's kind of a natural habit. So what we're hoping and not hoping, but what's happening is as a result of employees getting so engaged in cybersecurity awareness and and bringing their family into it, is we're reshaping their identity. We're reshaping a little bit about who they are. and so. when they get an email that has a phishing link in the email, most people's natural instinct, because this is how we've been groomed over the last 15 years since there's been links in email, is to click on the email, right? That's the instinct of most people is to click on the link in the email. Well, what we're doing is we're taking people from, and that's being curious, we're taking people from being curious to what I call cautiously skeptical, right? And so we don't want everybody running around and ever clicking on links because a lot of times, most of the time, links are good and they provide information on the back end of them. But we really want people to scrutinize those links and and the um, identity change that happens throughout our processes is really critical in getting people to like, not just instinctually want to click on a link, but they want to, you know, be cautiously skeptical of that link, if that makes sense. It does. And by bringing it home, you're not only furthering that chain that we just talked about, you're also educating the younger generation on what to be looking for. And our poor kids, whether they like it or not, get a daily training on privacy and security topics to the tune that our little one wrote a whole story about data breaches the other day as as her fun pastime. So the kids are listening, people. They are listening to what you are saying. And that's a good thing. 
We could just get the husbands to start listening. I know. Yeah. You know what? We're going to have a husband. conversation. It's going to be bonus training. Uh, <laughs> nice. Well, maybe with the right incentives, that will work. Anyway, um, changing gears a little bit. Can you share with us what your best personal cyber tip is from all of your years in cybersecurity and IT as well? My best tip. My my best tip is is uh, would be to to uh, watch your Ninja videos uh, as as they are released. Take them in, and then uh, you know take in the uh, the reinforcement material. Um, I, I guess that's too self promoting, but but let me think about uh, my best my best tip. Um, I think my 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 number one tip in it is to hackers are social engineers they prey on what they can find out about us on the internet which in my case is quite a bit um my number one tip would be scrutinize everybody that follows you on facebook if you don't know them don't let them follow you make sure that all your posts are private both on Facebook and on Instagram and on, um, you know, you can't make private posts, I guess, really on, on, on TikTok. Um, but really watch what you're disclosing about yourself online that isn't kind of general or public knowledge because hackers use, I don't want to use the word hackers because hackers are both good and bad. Bad actors can use that information against you. And they can create an entire persona about you online. And not only will they use that to perhaps fish you or socially engineer you, uh, even equally as bad, they'll use that information to create an identity out of you and have your identity stolen. So just be very careful about what you're putting out online and making sure that um, you know you're as private as possible, um, if if your persona allows for that. Those are some very good tips. Now, when you're not giving privacy and security tips, we're running a security training company. What do you like to do for fun? Probably my uh, biggest and most fun hobby that I try and do as much as possible is I paddle surf. And uh, it's a combination of paddle boarding and surfing. It's essentially where you're on a short surfboard kind of deal, but you have a big paddle in your hand and you go out into the waves and you paddle into the waves and you surf them just like a surfer would do. There you and go. There's your next sport you're going to try. <laughs> I like the idea of that. Nice. And Zach, thank you so much for sharing all your insight here today. If people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do so? Uh, shoot me an email. Uh, it's easy. It's Zach, Z-A-C-K at Ningio.com. N-I-N-J-I-O.com. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us here today. We really appreciate you helping to keep everyone safe. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening to the She Said Privacy, He Said Security podcast. If you haven't already, be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check us out on LinkedIn. See you next time.